morning again. That sound good? Good. Good. All right, we're going to get going, guys. How's everybody? It's good to see y'all again. It's kind of overcast today, but it's kind of nice, right? Not 110 degrees. The wind's not blowing and uh, messing everything up, flipping my pages. So I'm going to start off, I'm going to uh, just read us a, a, a verse out of First Thessalonians. And uh, it's not going to be the basis of the message, but it, it, it's going to kind of set the stage for it. I brought my glasses today. <laughs> Barry saved me last week. All right, in First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23... Paul says, he, he, he's doing a prayer for the Thessalonian church. He's, he's written a letter to them, his first letter to them. This is a church that he set up early on in his ministry. And, uh, and, and so he, he does a lot of teaching in here, a lot of admonishing. You know, there's some things going on there that, that uh, they got to get, get right to get the, the fullness of the blessing of God, right? You know, so, so he prays this at the end of... Uh, of his letter he says may God himself the God of peace peace means reconciliation peace means that we're that we're reconciled to God so may the God himself may God himself the God of peace sanctify remember that word in fact everybody say sanctify sanctify, right? sanctify you through and through May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen? So, Paul uses this word, sanctify. And um, we're going we're gonna to go through that, what that process is, because it's painful. Right? We sugarcoat a lot about this walk um, that, we, that we do when we come to Christ um, but it, it, it's it, it's a violent process and it's meant to be violent I, I want to uh, tell you guys a, a, a story y'all know that I went with uh, my brother brother Jeremy I went on his birthday and we went to that that concert up in uh, Colorado and uh, it was at Red Rocks, which is a, is a, a big natural amphitheater. Um, the, these, these eroded rocks that, uh, um, that create this natural um, stadium that, uh, that you sit in and, and the acoustics are wonderful and, and so forth. But um, I just want to talk a little bit about what, uh, what that trip was like. Because you're up in the mountains of Colorado, between Colorado Springs and Denver, and there's th these massive rock formations and mountains and so forth that, that, uh, that, that jut up out of the ground and go up to 16,000 feet. So, I mean, it's just like it's amazing, 16,000 feet. I'm being a little bit uh, ambitious there. But, but they go up 8, 10,000 feet, right? And we drove around... Uh, and, and did a lot of sightseeing while we were there. That's mainly what we did. We, we went around and we looked at the God's creation. You know? And it was pretty, pretty amazing. And I wasn't a great guest, right? Like, like I wasn't a great fellow to be around because I didn't talk much. I was just in awe of what God had, had created. And so... Uh, I, I didn't talk to my wife. I didn't talk to my friends much. I, you know, I just just was taking in the majesty of it. But what struck me most by these formations is the violence that it took to create them. So we we've got all of these features all over the earth that were born out of violence. Tectonic plates. You guys know tectonic plates, like uh, where um, the the continental plates rub against each other, and then you have fault lines that create earthquakes. 
and when these plates over billions of years have rubbed against each other, they, they, the, the violence of it causes these mountain ranges to rise up out of the ground. And you can see where they crushed against each other and, and they created these, these tall peaks and these layers and layers of earth, of different rock and different soils that are compressed. And in other places on the planet, we've had that, that violence has been created by meteors or asteroids that have come down and, and they have hit the planet and, and caused cataclysm, right? E even, even extinction of, of species on the earth o over time. And the Bible tells us that we look at creation and we see God in it, right? So... He, he created this, this beautiful thing out of the violence of a broken creation, right? So, uh, so that, anyway, that, that, that just, it just struck me, and as I, uh, over the last couple of weeks as I've come back, and he started to, to birth this message in me, um, that has played a big part in it. The, 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 the violence of what it of what it takes to transform okay? because that's what sanctification means sanctification means that he's transforming us he's molding us into something different he's taking the raw materials of who we are and he's he's molding and shaping that into something else so, something usable something peaceful and and i'm i'm going to go to another passage here and i'm going to explain what i believe that he is creating out of us are y'all still with me yeah. amen okay so i'm going to take us all the way back to genesis uh, chapter 2 the creation of adam and it says that and the Lord God formed, then the Lord God formed man. Formed man. He didn't oh. poof and there was man. He formed man. And it says he formed him from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils and the breath of life. He, he breathed, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. So I, I would submit to you that what God was creating here, what he was forming here, is a vessel. Okay? A, a vessel. Like this. Something that he can pour himself into. Because that's, that's what he wants. That's the relationship he wants with us. He wanted to form something that he could live inside of. That we could be a part of each other. Amen? Alright. So, and I got props today, guys. Amen. Got props. So, we're, we're going to get into that. And y'all, uh, we got a YouTube channel. And I was looking at it the other day. And sometimes I get a little discouraged about my, my gravitas. My ability to hold people's attention. Because on our YouTube channel, we get, we get the, all these views, right? But when I go and I look at the analytics of it. It says people stick around for about four minutes. So, so I'm going to tell you four minute people, stick around for the props. <laughs> <At the end. laughs> all right. So, all right. So, um, we're we're going to go over to Jeremiah, and uh, and I'm going to read this, and and, and y'all pray for me that we we get something out of it because it, it, this has really really blessed me. I'm not going to go into the history of Jeremiah. I'm not going to give you any background information because this is just standalone. This, what he sees here is, is good enough by itself. Amen? Amen? It says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house. And there I will give you my message. Actual Hebrew here is, I'll cause you to hear. I, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna show you something and I'm gonna tell you something and I'm gonna open up your understanding by what you see in here. Amen? That's why we got problems. <clears throat> so I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working at the wheel. Y'all understand what's going on here? We've got a potter that's sitting in front of a wheel with clay on the wheel and he is working to create a vessel. Amen? But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hand. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. The pot he was shaping became marred in his hand. Now, what that means is that it was ruined. It, it started to fall apart. Now, I, I can tell you this, there's nothing wrong with the potter. The potter's perfect. The potter's a master. The potter knows what he's doing. If the clay becomes marred, ruined in his hands, there's something wrong with the clay. We gotta find out what's wrong with the clay. <clears throat> so as I as I read that, as, it, as God gave me that, because I, I actually I just heard that. I was listening to somebody else. I was listening to somebody else talk about the Bible, just listening on another subject. And they read this, and man, it just, just hit me. There's more of it. We'll get to that. But as I as I thought about it and pondered it and meditated on it, I and, and God gave me that, that part that there's nothing wrong with the potter. There's something wrong with the clay. What was birthed in me is to find out how, how does clay come about? How does, how does that happen? What is clay? Huh? White clay. White clay, right. So let's talk, let, let's talk about that a second because it, it goes to what I was talking about with the violence of the earth. Here's how clay is formed. And it happens over hundreds of thousands, millions of years. As this violence on earth happens, and rocks are crushed, and there's wind erosion, and there's water erosion, and there's, uh, there's earthquakes, and meteors, and tectonic plates crushing against each other, and there's glacial erosions after the ice age that, that cut out these large swaths. And the, the result of all of that violence is dust. Dust happens. Right? And finite particles of hundreds of different rocks and soils and volcanic ash come together and they're so small, they're so tiny, they're so finite that they bind together, right? Now clay in its natural form is not, I'm going to move this out of the way because I want y'all, I, I, I was going to get this at the end but I want y'all to see it, okay? So clay in its natural form is not, not this, nope. right? This is clay, but this is not the natural form of clay. The natural form of clay, I need a Vanna White. <laughs> no, I'll stop. <laughs> this is clay. Okay. Can y'all see this? Yeah, y'all see that? That's clay. It's it's dry powder. Okay? And and, and it's a mixture of silica and ash and granite dust and aluminum oxide and, and all of these different things that come together. And and 
as I began to read about how clay forms naturally in the earth, I thought about all of the experiences that we go through in our life that makes up the clay that is us. Is it, God said he formed us from the dust of the ground. Right? He formed us from the dust. In, in the Midrash, in, in Hebrew, it says that God collected the dust and spit into it. He, he added water into it to make it pliable, to make it formable, right? And, and came up with this. So it's the experiences of our life, the violence that we go through that takes us to a form that God can add his spirit, the water to, to make it pliable in his hands so that he can form us. So, so, I, I'll pull this back over. I'll get back to the message. Y'all, uh, y'all stick with me as uh, I, I'm not going to try to rush. What do I do with my glasses, guys? Help me. Where am I? Oh, they're on the ground. <laughs> All right. I won't step on a pelican. All right. So, um, David, King David, y'all know King David, right? Amen. Okay. King David um, was a psalmist. He, he wrote about two thirds of the Psalms. And, um, and he, he, he wrote this one, and I think it's, uh, I think it's good for us to read it because it speaks to this. Uh, in the middle of Psalm 139, he says, You created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. <clears throat> and I know that your works are wonderful. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth. The depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me, saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book. Before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How precious to me are, are your thoughts towards me, God. How vast is the sum of them? Uh, I know I've said this before, um, and I'll, I'll say it again. You, you didn't just pop up. You've been in the mind of God for a million, million, billion years. He formed you in His, in his mind, in His spirit, before He ever created Adam, before He ever hung a star, before He ever hung the moon. Before the sun was ever in the sky, before there was anything in creation, you were in his mind and in his heart. And everything throughout creation, all of the violence, has been to get you here, to get you to this place. Right? So, uh, Paul talks about this, and, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of flip around here, guys, and y'all just bear with me. If you get bored with me, yell out something funny, and I'll, uh, I'll realize I'm taking too much time. But uh, Paul in in Romans chapter five talks about this process of sanctification. He talks about our justification first. So let's get this straight. When you come to Jesus, when you come to the cross, you are justified before God. It doesn't have anything to do with you. It has to do with what Jesus did. The price he paid. Right? It's a, you didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. Um, God just loved you so much that he came down here and paid a price so that you can be justified before Him. 
And let, let's talk about the word justified. Justified means it's just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I never had anything that was disrespectful or hateful to God. When we come to Jesus, we are justified and reconciled to Christ. That doesn't mean the process ends. Okay? So, let's listen to Paul talk about it. He says, um, he was delivered over to death for our sins, and he was raised to life for our justification. Justified. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, here's where it gets tough. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Amen? Amen. Alright. So we're justified before God by the price that He paid, by the sacrifice that He made. But then He says something else starts to go on inside of us. And he says, we glory in our sufferings. Okay? That speaks to this word that we talked about in Thessalonians. Y'all remember it? Sanctified. Being sanctified. Being set apart. Being molded. Right? So that's a process that goes on for the rest of our walk. And it can be uncomfortable. It can be violent. As he works to shape us and mold us and turn us into something that he can fill up completely. It's not a work. It's submission to him. Right? So when we look at everything that, that brings us to the point where we're at the cross, where we come to the cross, I, I, uh, I think about the, the uh, I've had people come to me through my life and, I, and I've said myself um, throughout my walk with Christ I, I, I've said uh, when I found God when I found God you guys familiar with that? any of you ever said it? when I found God well God wasn't lost right? He's been there the whole time. Whether you recognize Him or not, He has been there knocking at the door all your life. And He's been taking this, this whole montage, I'm going to move this thing again so I can use my props. He's been taking this whole, I might have to step around the backside. Wait for me. Man, I made a mess of my clay dust. So, look. When God found us, okay, because He's always been looking for us, but when we recognized that He wanted to be in a relationship with us, when we recognized He's always been there, we, uh, we look something like this. Now, give me a second to pour this out. That soil and sticks and rocks and chunks. We had a lot of stuff in us that, 
that God couldn't use to make something like this. Right, right here. Right. Now, out of this big pile here, there, there's clay in there. Clay dust in this pile of, of dirt. It has to be sifted and it has to be refined. And out of that, that amount of soil and dirt, junk and sticks and all, all the nastiness that we brought with us when we recognized that God wanted to be in a relationship with us. Out of that, you get about this much clay. Now follow me? This is what God has to work with out of what we bring to Him. All that. So, this is our justification point. <laughs> when we come to the cross, He takes us from this to this. And He doesn't want us to look back at this. He wants us to go from here. Now what does He have to do from here? He's got to add a little water. He's got to add a little spirit to get us to this point. To get us to a point where He can He can start to mold us. That He can start to, to make something out of us that's usable that brings us peace. Right? That this clay. And so he he begins to work on us. He begins to to uh, spin us on the wheel and make us into something unique. Can I tell you something about jars of clay? There's no two alike. There there's they're not full, they're not poured into a cast. They're formed. Each one of them has a different bump and a different uh, configuration. And even if it, even if you try to make them identical, they're not identical. They're a little bit different. You are completely unique in the kingdom of God. There's nobody like you. Nobody can can fulfill what God wants you to do in the earth but you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you something here, and, I, I, and I, I'm not going to continue to, to belabor this, but I, I'm going to read you something here about, about submission to this process that I read uh, in a book. Let me get back around there. No way. Good morning, Anthony. Good, good. How are you? Good, good. So this is from a devotional I read. Uh, um, uh, Oswald Chambers is called My Utmost for His Highest. It was written about 120 years ago. Um, but my, my November 3rd reading, yesterday's reading with this, it says, uh, he, he, the verse is from Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And his commentary on this is, it goes like this. These words mean the breaking and collapse of my independence brought about by my own hands. Go with me. These words mean the breaking and collapse of my independence brought about by my own hands and the surrendering of my life to the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. No one can do this for me. I must do it myself. God may bring me up to this point 365 times a year, but He cannot push me through it. It means breaking the hard outer layer of my individual independence from God and, li and the liberating of myself and my nature into oneness with Him. Not following my own ideas, but choosing absolute loyalty to Jesus. Has that breaking of my independence come? Question mark. Has that breaking of my independence come? All the rest is religious fraud. The one point, the one point to decide is, will I give up? Will I surrender 
to Jesus Christ, placing no condition whatsoever as to how the brokenness will come. Did y'all get that? The one point to decide is will I give up, will I surrender to Jesus Christ, placing no conditions whatsoever as to how the brokenness will come. I must be broken from my own understanding of myself. When I reach that point, immediately the reality of the supernatural identification with Jesus Christ takes place. And the witness of the Spirit of God is unmistakable. I have been crucified with Christ. So we got a decision to make, right? He's done the heavy lifting. He took us from this to this to this. But this, going, going from this to this, is a process. We're in the potter's hand. He's spinning us on the wheel. He's forming us into that thing that he needs to fulfill his purpose in the earth. There's a verse in, in Matthew chapter 11, which I think it may be one of the most misunderstood verses in the entire Bible. Um, and it's mistranslated by a lot of Bibles. It says, uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says to them, from the days of John the Baptist to, to, until now, the kingdom of God suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. And now most people, and again, a lot of Bibles, completely misconstrue the context of what Jesus is saying and the original language that it was written in by saying that that is talking about Satan and his forces coming against the kingdom of God. And trying and, and taking over the kingdom of God. Right? No chance, brother. No chance. The devil ain't got no business. What this is saying is, is that this transformation that he's taking us through is violent. And the, when it says the violent take it by force, that word violent there means determined. I am going to, I'm going to grab onto his him. I'm going to grab onto Jesus and I'm not letting go. I, I'm going to submit everything within me to him because his way is better than mine. Amen. Amen. So, yeah, it's not a comfortable process. It's not. It's not fun. But Paul says, we glory in our suffering. Because our sufferings produce in us perseverance. The, it, the strength to continue to go on. And that perseverance produces character. Character. Character, my uniqueness to operate in my gift. To operate in the full purpose and destiny that he has for me. And that character produces hope. Amen? Amen. Hope. And what is hope? Hope is fulfilled by the infilling of His Spirit. That when He's got us right here to this point where He's made a vessel, He can pour into that vessel His Spirit. And that He can fill us up to where we're overflowing. And it pours out to other people. And it just keeps coming. And coming. And coming. Amen? Amen. I got one more and I'm going to close up with this. Guys. First Corinthians. <clears throat> I thought I had it marked. Yeah. 
Y'all still with me? Paul says this in First First Corinthians chapter four. He says, "But we have this treasure in jars of clay. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side." but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always care around, carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you uh, for, for molding us. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for separating us from all of the things that we used to be into something that you could add your spirit to and form and shape and mold. Lord, we ask that you would just give us the willingness to see what you have purposed for us. That your way is better. And that if we'll just lay it down to you, if we will become malleable, moldable in your hands, that we will reach the full peace and, and glory of what you have for us. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, before I, before I wrap up, I never finished that verse in Jeremiah. Can we go back there for one second? Do that? No, I already prayed us out. So I'll read the whole thing. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel, but the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord, here's the rest of the story, then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, can I not do with you as this potter does? Like clay in the hands of the potter, so are you in my hands. Amen. All right. Praise God. Thank y'all. We'll get back to the worship.